This episode of the Astro Powder Podcast is brought to you by Gama. Color changes have never been so easy and fast. Gama's Optiflex Pro Q unit provides the fastest color change for a manual powder gun in the industry at 35 seconds. This can be as much as an 80% reduction in your typical changing process. Power Clean technology, built into our Optiflex Pro Q unit, efficiently cleans the entire powder path from injector to gun tip so you're ready for quick color changes without any manual adjustments. To speak with a representative or schedule a demonstration, call 877-437-6771. That's 877-437-6771. And be sure to mention, Ask Joe sent me. Bring it, boost it, change it, finish it. Now is the time to complete it with Gamma. <laughs> Hello, all you powder coating fans, and welcome to episode 45 of the Ask Joe Powder podcast. I'm your host, Joe Powder, a.k.a. Kevin Biller, and with me, as always, is my esteemed colleague, sidekick, Nathan. He's known by people in these parts as the anti-PFAS kid. He's ChemQuest Powder Coating's formulator, dude. Ho, ho, ho. But enough about your mom, your sister, and that girl that you're into at Panera. We're broadcasting from the ChemQuest Powder Coating Research Studios in Columbus, Ohio. The purpose of the Ask Joe Powder podcast is to bring the latest news and technical know-how to the global powder coating community. So let's get it rolling. But before we do, I'd like to give a hearty shout-out to... Paul Bradley. If you don't know Paul, Paul's the technical manager for PPG Powder Coatings located in Gainesville, Texas. He's been there for almost 10 years, and he's responsible for uh, mainly all the R&D in the industrial powder coatings um, that are produced there. He's also involved with quality control and other kind of technology. Um most recently, he's been involved with the uh, retro-reflective powder coating technology that's been uh, assumed by Lyft on their new city bike. But if you go back to the history of uh, Paul's uh, career, he got his start in Felling, which is uh, just outside of Newcastle upon Tyne in uh, northeast um, England. He had to start in 1988. It's been about 10 years for what was then Courtauld's International Paint. It's now an AXO uh, Nobel uh, Powder Coating Center of Excellence. He came to the United States and worked for Trimite for over 14 years, and he was uh, kind of their top technical person there, uh, product development, QC, technical service, etc., so he's got a very interesting, well-grounded experience in powder coating technology. But we're giving Paul a shout out for a couple of reasons. Um, here's here's a, a quote directly from Paul. He says, "Product development is a journey, and there is no end. There is always something to learn, even in failure. As I get older, I find it fun to coach." And watch others develop, too, much like your children. Bravo, Paul. That's a pretty good observation, and, and I, uh, I um, concur with your perspective on that. But most important, um, Paul, besides being such an accomplished technologist with lots of experience, he brings a sense of decency and kindness to everything he does, both professionally and personally so. Shout out to you, Paul Bradley. Keep up the good work. Okay, now we're ready for our Guess What segment. Guess what? All right, our first one comes from European Coatings Journal, and they report that Kansai Helios signed an agreement to acquire 100% of CWS Black Fabrique. 
CWS with its group companies, it's powder coating and liquid and solid synthetic resins producer with more than 150 years of tradition. And it's head, headquartered in Durin in Germany. Yeah, you know, um, CWS, it, it, it is one of the leaders. I, I believe it's in the top three in Germany as far as powder producers. And right. They don't have a huge presence in the U.S. Although they, they do have production and they sell some powder over here. But yeah, in Germany, this is a pretty big acquisition here. Because my understanding, I don't think that Kansai Helios had any powder up until now. I think you may be right about that. They may have some in the Far East. You know, what, what Kansai gets in this uh, acquisition, not only do they get the German operation, which obviously is the headquarters, they also have um, operations in Denmark and Poland. And uh, speaking of the facility and business that they have in the United States, it's in Blauvent, New York. It's Upper State New York, and a good friend of mine, Jonathan Abrams, uh, has been the leader of that business and operation for over 20 years. And um, they're an interesting company in the U.S. because they're more of a sleeper. It's like you don't see them coming. What they do is very well. They've got some really good technology, and and they, they compete very well in the market. So I uh, hope it works out for everyone, especially my friend Jonathan um, Abrams. Hopefully, it's going to be a, a, a good thing for everyone. All right, and this also comes from European Coatings Journal. The European Court of Justice has declared that titanium dioxide was wrongly classified as carcinogenic. Just in 2019, they made a decision that titanium dioxide in powder form is to be classified as carcinogenic if it's inhaled. But they're talking about particles that contain at least 1% titanium dioxide particles that are smaller than or about 10 microns? Yeah, this this one's interesting because when that one, when this came up in uh, 2019, it got everybody nervous, especially the powder coating industry because, you know, the question was, okay, we, we, we deal in particles and if some of the particles are small and if some of them have a percentage of of TiO2, which most of them 1% TiO2. That's like almost everything that we make that's not, you know, clear or a pure mass tone. For sure. And, you know, this is interesting, too, because, you know, you hear it from nearly everyone who's in the industry says, you know, once Europe makes a decision, you know, they don't go back. And when this one came out, Nate, I was, I was kind of flabbergasted that, they could call call this carcinogenic. I don't think they had enough toxicological information to make that call. And, you know, the other question is, from a practical standpoint, there's there's no alternative to titanium right. dioxide. There's nothing close. Not a good one, at least. So, anyway, interesting development. And, yeah, I think that they, they made the right decision, and we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, and I think what it came down to was it's not – the titanium particles that were made respirable in powder coatings. So, yeah, for sure. Um, the an interesting side note on this though is that CWS powder coatings was one of the actual one of the main um, drivers in contesting the original ruling, and they, along with the Titanium Dioxide Manufacturers Association, are kind of credited with um, helping this get overturned yeah that's an interesting footnote right and ppcj reports that axo nobel powder coatings has unveiled new capability for bonded metallic powder coatings in north africa so their manufacturing facility in egypt now they're able to do bonding there and so you know any sort of um commercial powder coating that has metallic effect pearlescent anything like that typically are bonded in the factory. I think we've talked about that process quite a bit on the show, but they have the ability in North Africa. So that region will be able to get their powder bonded. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's interesting because Axel Nobel has an outpost, if you want to call it that in Egypt. And you know, it's, it's more than an outpost. They have a 
pretty significant operation there. They're certainly leaders in the region, um, and I, I, I give them a lot of credit for making an investment there. A lot of people are a little shy of investing in, in Africa. But I've got some friends there, and they do a wonderful job. I think it's a great operation, good people. They're all very dedicated and uh, very professional, so it's good. And I, I, I hope in the future, you know, organizations, companies like this, you know, investing in Africa uh, can help help develop the economies for for the emerging industry industrial countries uh, in Africa. So it's, it's great news. Nice to see that they're investing. All right, friends. It's now time for our. Q and A portion of our podcast. Do you have a question? Ask Joe Powder. Well, you can ask him. Ask Joe Powder. He has the answer. That'll advance your powder coating. It's the Ask Joe Powder podcast. All right, our first question comes from Clarissa in Greater Brighton and Hove area in um, Great Britain. She says, "Good day, Joe. Are you able to sell, preferably, winky face emoji, or donate used powder from the extractor bins to anyone to recycle?" Someone mentioned that they may use it in laying new roads, but I also wondered if there may be a market somewhere to use it on metal that wouldn't be seen, like RSJs and such. If you know the answer or are able to guide me to ask elsewhere, I would be grateful. I would love it to not just end up in a landfill. Best wishes, Clarissa. Hey, Clarissa. Um, nice hearing from you. you, you you're located in the, the Brighton area, which um, I used to live in England for a couple of years, and it's kind of funny. Um, I visited a small town, which is just west of Brighton, a small town called Worthing. And, and if people are familiar with the geography, Brighton and the small town of Worthing are, are right on the English Channel, which is kind of cool. It's a nice area. Anyway, thank you for your question. It's a good one. And I think there's a certain degree of misunderstanding in the whole proposition of handling surplus or spent powder coating. So uh, I'm going to talk it through and and see if I can help you. There are a few options that you can consider. One of them is if you you know what the coating is, you can possibly use it for a requirement that doesn't have a, a really strong or strict aesthetic specification uh, because, you know, oversprayed or reclaimed powder might be a blend of different types of material, different colors, different glosses. Um, The thing you got to watch is if there's a requirement for film performance, um, and we're kind of discounting the aesthetic requirement, but if there's a requirement for durability, uh, you know, if it's, if it's mechanical or, you know, abrasion resistance or, um, corrosion resistance or anything like that, you have to be very careful. And I'll explain that in a moment. But let's look at another option. Um, and, and this was presented to the industry by a gentleman uh, who's the CEO of GBB International. Um, his name is Sanjeev Bagaria. He made a presentation at the 2022 powder coating summit back in September this year. And he had some interesting um, applications where he felt uh, surplus powder or spent powder could be used as kind of like a filler or a binder for a, a few different materials. And one of them were garden pavers. So instead of like asphalt or, or roadways or anything, these are, you know, simple pavers that you, you would use to to put paths or maybe even patios in in your backyard or garden. Uh, Another application he thought could be useful is incorporating these materials as a filler for patching compounds, which I think you've got to be careful with that. Again, if if there's a requirement, you you got to be careful that you're not degrading the properties. That's what, yeah, I I was at that um, presentation and I thought they had some really interesting ideas I think he was looking at it as there's this particle that we need to find a use for. Can we use it as a filler for different things? Um, but yeah, my question would be like uncross-linked powder coatings, like in a particulate form, have no 
resistance to anything really. So most of these I'd be concerned about um, being dissolved by any kind of chemicals washed away by water or just degrading over time. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that's true, Nate. I think you're skating on thin ice here as far as um, incorporating this into products that have any type of uh, performance requirements. I love the thought exercise, though, of like, okay, what can we do with this stuff? Yeah. Now, you know, that being said, um, there are a couple of companies that have investigated and actually commercialized using an overspray or surplus powder coating as a component for a product. In this case, it would be to use it as a base to formulate another powder coating. And basically, the concept is take surplus powder coatings and use it as a base to make new powder coatings. Uh, a company called Innova Coat, which is located in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I mean, just north of Grand Rapids, they've been doing this, and, and they, they they claim they've had some success uh, commercially, and, you know, hats off to them. Um, I think the thing that's important, with, I believe they're doing, is they take the surplus powder, they characterize it so they know what it is, mm-hmm. and then they use it as a base for something that's useful in the field. And they claim that the economics work, that you can make a, a, a product and, and it, it, you can make a profit off of it. So that's that's pretty good stuff. I've seen a very similar process um, of all places in Villafranca, Sicily. And my good friends at Steel Belt Systems or SBS, they have a powder system, powder facility, I guess you'd call it, uh, in Sicily where um, part of what they do is they re reprocess spent powder coatings. They're really smart people. They do it from a technical perspective, and 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 apparently it works for them. So another option is I've seen spent powder coating, and I think again it has to be a, you know like a known type quality used as a binding agent for insulation insulation that's made out of kind of fabric fibers. I've seen this uh, in, in production, actually, where a continuous mat of fibers is conveyed horizontally, and then the surplus powder is sprinkled into the, into the mat of fibers, and the next step is these powder-laden fibers are then compressed and heated creating kind of like a tough batting that can be used as an insulative sound deadener. And they were telling me they were using this for automotive applications where like on the the floor of car bodies before the, the carpet or the, the floor mats are put in, and, and even in the doors, they said it worked. Well, and that makes sense because there's not a very high aesthetic requirement for sound deadening materials, whereas anything that you're using as a paint, or as a decorated ob- object, like even if we call it a functional coating and say that the appearance doesn't really matter, it matters. There's always going to be an aesthetic requirement. So yes. um, if you're just talking about binder for fibrous mats, then it's probably less critical. And, and it works. And it, it's a kind of a low end, you know, end use. Now, I kind of want to wrap up with saying, you know, this misunderstood aspect. One of the premises is, you know, assessing the quality of, you know, materials that were, you know, essentially heading for the landfill. It's an inexact science. You know, unless you do rigorous compositional analysis or you actually know what the products are, it's difficult to really assess what, the components are in the formula and hence what kind of performance to expect. Um, so consequently, like demanding quality type end uses like structural concrete uh, it might be used for bridges, roads, or building structures, you've got to avoid even contemplating that. What I've found is the quality of the concrete used is strictly regulated and controlled, and therefore there's really no room for 
kind of a questionable or unknown composition filler to be a, a component of that end product. Now, regardless, I, I got to believe there are some entrepreneurs maybe in your neck of the woods, and I say in the UK, that might be coming up with something we haven't thought of. Um, and you know, I'll keep my eyes and ears open. If I run across any of them, I certainly let you know, Clarissa. So thanks for your questions. Kind regards, Joe. All right, fans, it's time for a word from our sponsors. GEMA's Optistar All-in-One Control Unit leads the industry with a design fusing electrostatics and powder feed in one compact device. By combining the powder injector and control unit functionality into one device, you get the highest coating efficiency, fastest response times of powder output, and excellent cleaning performance. For more information, call 877-437-6771. Once again, that's 877-437-6771. And be sure to mention, Ask Joe sent me. Configure it, feed it, optimize it, integrate it. Complete it with GEMA. The Powder Coating Research Group is now part of the ChemQuest Group, proud sponsor of the Ask Joe Powder podcast. ChemQuest Powder Coating Research is the only independent laboratory dedicated to powder coating technology. We do everything from evaluating raw materials, formulating the next generation of coating, developing new products, consulting, testing, troubleshooting, and training. Our parent company, ChemQuest, provides expert business strategy and advisory services in all aspects of the specialty chemicals value chain, including expertise in both liquid and powder coating. To find out more, visit our website at powdercoatingresearch.com or ChemQuest's website at www.chemquest.com. You can email Kevin Biller at kbiller at chemquest.com. Thanks for listening to the Ask Joe Powder Podcast. The ChemQuest Group is the parent company of CQPCR and provides strategic consulting to companies throughout the specialty chemicals value chain, including advisory services on business strategy, market research, mergers, acquisitions, or divestitures, manufacturing excellence, and formulation, application development, and benchmarking for liquid coatings and adhesives through our sister facility, the ChemQuest Technology Institute. Please contact Edie Fox Abrams, Vice President of Business Development at info at chemquest.com. All right, welcome back. Our next question comes from Allison Lee in Boise, Idaho. I believe she's had a question on here before. Allison asks, curious if you know about powder coating over bonderized steel. What, if any, pretreatment is necessary? Is it like paint lock? Hey, Allison. <clears throat> How's it going? Um, yeah, Allison's a, a, a longtime listener. Um, she's asked me questions through the years. Uh, they, they run a powder coating job coating shop called Coatings Plus in Boise, Idaho. And I think they do a really good job. So good to hear from you, Allison. To your question, first of all, many people get this term bonderized, which is bonderized steel, confused with the trade name bonderite. Now, bonderite is a family of metal pretreatments. The brand is owned by Henkel, and it's basically cleaning and pretreatment chemicals for a, a kind of a, a variety of metals and has been a mainstay in the coatings industry since the late 1950s. So what we're talking about here, fans, it's not bonderite. We're going to be talking about bonderized, bonderized steel. Um, bonderized steel, it consists of hot dip galvanized steel, and I think the grade is typically G90, which refers to the weight or the thickness of the galvanizing or zinc layer on steel. But there's an additional phosphate pretreatment that's applied, and that's you know rinsed, and, and typically a chromate sealer is applied, and the, 
the sheet metal, the, the galvanized steel is then dried off in an oven. This term bonderize is commonly referred to as paint grip. And e- even unpainted, it is uh, commonly used for roofing, for wall panels, and also just coil that might be processed uh, further into other fabricated goods. So you mentioned paint lock, and and basically you're saying, is this bonderized uh, the same as paint lock? Well, it's close. And it's <laughs> the trade name is electro paint lock, and it refers to electro galvanized steel that optionally has a, a phosphate pretreatment. ASTM A591, um, which is a standard specification for sheet steel, electrolytic zinc coated for light coating weight, blah, 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 ASTM words. That ASTM test method, A591, actually is describing the electro paint lock material. So keep that in mind. When you want to put this in perspective, this electro paint lock was trademarked by Republic Steel, which you got to be a certain generation to remember that name. But it was it was trademarked and well developed and trademarked in 1942. Currently, or most recently, belonged to the International Steel Group. So it's uh, questionable if this stuff's still out there in the in, in the industry. One other thing I want to mention, uh, galvanized steel uh, is mentioned as also uh, under the umbrella of electro paint lock. And galvanized, or I should say galvanized steel, um, it's, it's not a pure zinc type galvanizing layer. It's actually a, um, uh, an alloy or a blend of zinc and iron, which gives it usually people say gives you you better paint adhesion but it also gives you better um, adhesion of the zinc alloy layer to steel so giving you a lot here to swallow but the thing that i think is important you you mentioned what pretreatment might be needed well bonderized steel already has a pretreatment so i would recommend you just clean it if you're going to be using that type of product if you want to learn more about it, and, and this will shock you, but if you go to www.bonderize.com, they'll give you more information than I just gave you. So, in summary, um, bonderized and paint lock or electro paint lock are types of zinc or zinc alloy uh, that's been applied to um, sheet steel and that are typically um, phosphated to give better coating adhesion and also better durability. Um, So hope that helps, Allison. Hope things are going well in Idaho. If you have any further questions, be happy to answer them. Your friend, Joe Powder. All right, folks, it's time to talk about upcoming events. Hey, friends, where are we going? To an upcoming event. All right, coming up December 5th through 7th, 2022, is the Coding Summit in Miami, Florida. Uh, if I understand correctly, that one's more focused on executive level, like C-level people, movers and shakers. I don't well, know. Here, here's a clue, Nate. <laughs> it looks like a great uh, a, a great event. It's, it's kind of more or less like a conference. But I looked at, hey, register for this. Click on the registration, and it's like fifty five hundred dollars or something. It's it's like not for your average Joe. Um, <laughs> sorry, but it, it it really is like you said, sea level. And the people speaking at it are they're CEOs of major coding suppliers, both in Europe and in North America. I believe there's one from Japan as well. So, yeah, this is sea level. Move along, move along. There's nothing to see here. Yeah, I wasn't invited to that one. This kind of big news, China Coat and SF China 2022 Guangzhou will be rescheduled. Uh, the China Coat 
at the China Import and Export Fair Complex in Guangzhou, China, from the 6th to 8th December, is going to be rescheduled. That's I haven't been to it. You have, but that's probably the biggest show in the world, right, for the coding industry. I, yes, I would. I would. I would say um, numbers wise, it's the biggest. Um, as far as the most important, I'm gonna have to have to. My vote gets the European coding show mm-hmm. because of yeah, the 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 amount of knowledge technology. It, it's going to be greater in Europe, and it's also a very large show. But yes, uh, China coat. Uh, I think just as far as number of warm bodies in a conference center, yeah, it's bigger it's convention huge. center. It's and huge. then there's the SF China online shows, which was supposed to be from the 30th of November to the 30th of December. That's also going to be rescheduled. So we'll have to watch out for when those come back. It's all about the COVID kind of lockdowns in China. Presumably, yeah. February 12th through 17th, 2023, is the International Waterborne High Solids and Powder Coating Symposium. Or people usually call it the Waterborne Symposium for short, but that's in New Orleans, Louisiana. And then the one you just mentioned, the European Coating Show, the big show in Nuremberg, Germany. That's the 27th through 30th of March, 2023. We got to go. We got to go, Nate. We got to figure out a way. Because I'd love to go to that show. We got a lot of friends in Europe. Never been to that one. Okay, friends. If you're looking for the Ask Joe Powder column in print, which print is a relative term now because a lot of these trade magazines and journals have gone digital and no longer print their uh, product and, and send it through the post. But you can find it in PPCJ, which is Polymer's Paint Color Journal. Their sister publication as well, which is APCJ, Asia Pacific Coatings Journal. We're also featured in PCI Magazine, that's Paint and Coatings Industry. In 2023, we're going to be in almost every uh, every issue of that. We're certainly in every issue of IPCM, our very good friends at International Paint and Coatings Magazine, I want to give a shout out to Alessia and Ilaria. I got to meet both of them at FabTech. It was wonderful, wonderful people. You can go to the Powder Coated Tough Archives online at powdercoating.org. That's the website for the Powder Coating Institute. And if you hadn't had enough of this, Starting in 2023, I'm going to be going as Kevin Biller, Ask the Expert in Products Finishing Magazine. So with my new friend Scott Francis as uh, the editor and, of course, Todd Luciano as uh, the guy running the show. All right. You can find us online at askjoepowder.com. If you want to ratio one of our hot takes uh, on Twitter, it's at a.k.a. Joe Powder. We have a YouTube channel that we'd appreciate if you subscribe to that or if you just like to listen to your podcast that way. Uh, the YouTube channel uh, is linked in the description. And you've probably noticed anybody that's followed the show for any amount of time that we don't uh, always put out the shows on a strict schedule. And we've got jobs. This is a our day job seems to get in the way. Of, we've been busy here, folks. Yeah, but what you can do is subscribe, whether you're using an app or Apple Podcasts or um, Audible, any of those. You can subscribe, and it'll alert you when an episode comes up, so you can listen to it right away. I, I get I get mine faxed to me when they come out. <laughs> I guess that's probably an option, too. And if you'd like to ask a question, the email address is askjoepowder at yahoo.com, or you can call us and leave a message at country code 1-478-2-ASK-JOE. That's 1-478-227-5563. This has been a production of ChemQuest Powder Coating Research. 
original music editing and sound design is by Nick Page. Take off, you hosers. (laughs) And keep your powder dry. Thank you for listening to the Astro Powder Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Gama. You have a lot going on every single workday with many things requiring your attention, but you shouldn't have to worry about the efficiency and productivity of your powder coating shop. Gama automated powder coating systems offer you greater efficiencies while producing consistent, high quality results. We provide the very best in powder delivery, application technology, connectivity for smarter factory automation, and comprehensive powder management solutions. To learn more, visit completeitwithgama.com. To speak with a representative or schedule a demonstration, call 877-437-6771. And be sure to mention, Ask Joe sent me. Synchronize it, change it, integrate it, automate it. Now is the time to complete it with Gama. Late 1919. All right. Well, that's a wrap for me. Good job, everybody. Yeah, I think that's an episode. I think that's a good one.